Welcome. This is Plodcast. The Plodcast Podcast. This is episode 53. Um, good to have you with us. So I want to talk today about the crisis in higher education. The crisis in higher education. Um, we are in the middle of a higher education bubble, which I think is going to be followed by a crash. And we have to, um, th- there are multiple areas where we have to rethink what we are what we are doing. And, um, and this especially includes Christian parents who are, if they have kids, they are in, engaged in the work of uh, saving, many of them saving up for college and what are we going to do with our kids when they graduate. Um, and so uh, I believe that conservative Christian parents have done a much better job thinking through the implications of uh, K through 12 education than they have done thinking through the implications of higher education. Uh, there are various reasons for this, but there is a, a, a much more fundamental loyalty uh, that Christians have uh, toward their alma mater at the college level than they, than they do when they're thinking about uh, education uh, in grade school, for example. Um, and that makes sense. If your great grandfather went to Ole Miss and your grandfather went to Ole Miss and, and you went to Ole Miss and, you know, where's your son going to go? Right. So um, so the pressure is on. But I don't think we've don't think we've thought it through uh, when the uh, when the, the the recent resurgence of uh, Christian education in America and and with the subset that I've been involved in, the resurgence of classical Christian education in America, this uh, has happened within the last generation. All right, so within the last generation, hundreds and hundreds of K through 12 schools have formed. And the reason they formed was because the parents became highly dissatisfied with the school down the street. The kids weren't learning to read or there was uh, too many drug deals on the, on the playground or there was one condom on a banana in the classroom too many. You know, you, there, there, were, there were just all sorts of reasons why uh, Christian parents became disenchanted with the K through 12 experience. And their kids were young, their kids were vulnerable, their kids, um, and so, they basically said, not with my child, you don't. And they began to pull their children out. And they went down the street and started a Christian school. Okay, so far so good. But many of these Christian parents don't realize that uh, the, the education meltdown is just as serious at the college level as it is in the K-12 through level. In fact, in some some ways, more serious because the rebellion the rebellion is more pronounced, and with the Christian colleges that are available, almost all Christian colleges are over a century old. Now there are a handful of exceptions, um, uh, Patrick Henry and and New St Andrews, and there are a handful of exceptions that are uh, colleges that have started in recent years in much the same way that. The, all the K through 12 Christian schools have started, but most Christian schools are, uh, you know, they've got brick buildings with ivy on them, and they are part of the educational establishment. And what does that mean? Well, unfortunately, one of the things it means is that they are complicit when it comes to the acceptance of government money, federal aid, and uh, if you take if you take federal aid, one of the lessons that uh, we should remember is he who takes the king's coin becomes the king's man. And uh, if you take federal aid, then you're subject to all sorts of um, regulations and restrictions, Title IX issues, and, and so on. Are you in a position to simply offer your college education and uh, and and offer to your students and to their parents what you think the Bible would have you do, what you think God would have you do, 
without having to check with some federal agency? Are you able to hire the best teacher that you believe is available to teach that history course without having to worry about uh, what some federal bureaucrat says about hiring and firing procedures? Um, a, lot of, a lot of Christian uh, colleges are not in a position to draw a line biblically and say, no, this is what we're going to do, and we have no we have no pressures on us to do it other ways because the, you know it's we're not dealing with extra biblical pressures that that would tempt us to compromise there aren't that many schools that are in a position of uh, are, are in that luxurious position of saying we don't take government money and so we don't have to pay attention to what they are saying the other thing is be, uh, one of the things that we have to recognize is that the presence of government money dislocates one of the one of the most important things about any service or commodity and that is the price of it why does it cost tens of thousands of dollars a year to attend college well it might have to do with um, the football team might have to do with the climbing wall might have to do with the lazy river it might have to do with the unionization of the faculty. It might have to do with a number of things that have to do with um, uh, our approach to government interference and government regulation. Approximately 30% of Americans uh, attend college. Approximately 30%. Now, I would want to argue with any kind of diligence and hard work, we could cut that number in half. Uh, too many people go to college. College is seen as too much of a savior, too much of a, uh, an answer to all ills. Um, I don't think it's the universal panacea that, that secularists tend to assume that it is. And that's why they're, they're, they've got the full court press on, at least the socialists do, where they're promising free college education, uh, free college education for everyone, right? that and free chocolate milk for everybody. The, what you see there is an implicit faith in education as a savior. If, if you're a Christian, you believe that Jesus is your savior uh, and not education. If you believe that man is God, then man, if, you, if you're a humanist, you mean that man, you believe that man is basically good. Well, if man is basically good, then why does he do evil? Well, the answer, going back at least to the time of Socrates, is that man does evil because he is ignorant. And if the problem is ignorance, as opposed to the Christian answer to that question, the problem is rebellion, the problem is sin, the problem is uh, the, a moral antipathy toward God. Um, and that requires a savior like Jesus dying on the cross. But if you believe the problem is ignorance, then what's the answer? Well, the answer is the school. The answer is a program. The answer is a teacher. The answer is to fund someone to tell people what the answer is. So um, I, I don't believe that an educational reformation in America is going to happen until Christian parents stop uh, feeding the beast. The higher, edu higher education um, system in America overall is utterly corrupt. There are pockets of excellence here or here and there, but overwhelmingly state to state, land grant university to land grant university, the Ivy League schools, overall the system is utterly corrupt. And, um, and Christians need to really be putting on their walking shoes. We need to be, be preparing to walk away. Okay, here's a weird book review. Um, my book for this uh, episode, uh, episode 53 of the podcast, is uh, a book called The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce. Uh, Ambrose Bierce was a, an old curmudgeon, uh, non-believing curmudgeon, um, who put together a bunch of pithy and witty definitions that were filled with 19th century snark. Ambrose Bierce uh, ended his life in, a, um, in an interesting way. 
he uh, disappeared into Mexico. Um, so, and some people think uh, Pancho Villa got him. Um, so it, we don't know. We don't know what happened to him. He he was a veteran of the of the Civil War. Wrote some wrote some short stories, but he wrote this book, The Devil's Dictionary, which I've read uh, multiple times, and uh, and really enjoyed. Despite the fact that he's not a believer, he he knows how to uh, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Uh, his definition of Christian is um, someone who believes the New Testament is a divinely inspired book, admirably suited to the spiritual needs of his neighbor, one who follows the teachings of Christ insofar as it is not inconsistent with the life of sin. That would be an example. Rum, he defines rum as a substance which pr- produces madness in total abstainers. Right? That's the kind of... That's the kind of uh, uh, thing you get, exhort, exhort, and that is to put the conscience of another upon the spit and roast it to a nut brown discomfort. So if you, so I one of the things I do, uh, uh, an episode or, or so ago, I talked about the writing life, and one of the things I've done as a writer is I've given myself to the periodic reading of dictionaries. This is a um, a satiric dictionary. It's a it's a dictionary that has a lot of uh, uh, fun stuff in it. It's a it's a laugh out loud dictionary, which some dictionaries aren't. But I confess that I do read dictionaries. I've re- I've read dictionaries of slang. I've read regular uh, dictionaries. I've read uh, so I and and when you read a dictionary, you're not reading it for the plot. You're not you know it's going to drag a little bit. So one of the things you do when you're reading a dictionary is you get one of those little page pointer things and you just sit down and read the first page and um, and then move the move the page pointer and the next day just read a page and highlight any interesting words you find highlight any interesting uh, <laughs> and 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 you will come come across all kinds of things um, well, this is not the Devil's Dictionary, but one of the dictionaries I read recently was a dictionary of Indo-European word roots. Um, so Indo-European is this aboriginal language that lies behind many of the languages of the world today. We don't even know where the Indo-Europeans lived. We don't. There's no archaeology. There's no cities. There's no nothing. So all we have is a reconstructed... Um, uh, linguists have reconstructed a number of the word roots looking at, at the languages that have descended from Indo-European. And even there I found some things. I, For example, my grandkids call my wife Nana. Um, and that was, uh, there. sure enough, there it was in the, in the dictionary of Indo-European word roots. So devote yourself to um, the reading of dictionaries. And if you, if you think that this is uh, weird, start with the fun ones. And um, and probably the funnest one would be Ambrose Bierce's The Devil's Dictionary. But there are other fun ones. Mrs. Burns' Dictionary of Unusual Words is a, another one that's really, uh, really good. Dictionaries of slang are oftentimes a lot of fun. So I, I commend the practice of reading dictionaries to you. And if you want to wade in from the shallow end of the pool, then The Devil's Dictionary, Ambrose Bierce. So that, Hamartiology, episode 53, here we are. Paul uses Hamartia uh, twice in the book of Colossians. In the first instance, he reminds the Colossians that they had redemption through the blood of Christ, a redemption that amounted to, quote-unquote, forgiveness of sins, 114. The second use involves more metaphorical subtleties. He says in 2.11, that the Colossians have been circumcised with the circumcision, the circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. So just as circumcision removed the foreskin, so the circumcision without hands removed the body of the sins of the flesh. The image clearly is that the foreskin represented the old corrupt man, but he then goes on to equate this with burial and baptism. That's in 2.12 something that represented the same spiritual operation, although in this case, 
Instead of the foreskin being uh, removed by circumcision, the dirt was removed by the washing with water. So the old corrupt man is represented in the old covenant with the, uh, the foreskin, and the imagery of circumcision removed that old corrupt man. Uh, in the image of baptism in the New Testament, uh, in the New Testament era, uh, the baptism is, uh, removes filth. The washing removes filth, which is the corrupt nature. Uh, it also, incidentally, and this is important, this short passage is a stumbling block for many people. But if we, if we lay it out carefully, we can see how circumcision and baptism relate. The circumcision spoken of here is clearly spiritual circumcision, uh, quote-unquote, without hands, and refers to the circumcision of the heart by the Spirit of God, which Paul refers to elsewhere in Romans 2.29. And from this, we can conclude the same thing about baptism, i.e. that there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the heart. So spirit circumcision uh, corresponds to spirit baptism. Uh, what happens in spiritual circumcision, i.e. regeneration, is the same thing that happens in spiritual baptism, regeneration. So spiritual circumcision is not being equated with physical baptism. Let me say that again. Spiritual circumcision is not being equated with physical baptism. Neither is physical circumcision being directly connected with physical baptism. But there is an indirect uh, connection that's being made. So if you were to draw a square on the board and at each corner, you, you know, one corner you put spiritual circumcision at the corner on the opposite side, you, spiritual baptism. Then at the next corner you put physical circumcision and then you put uh, physical baptism. Well, if, if spiritual circumcision and spiritual baptism are the same thing, and physical circumcision represents spiritual circumcision, and if physical baptism represents spiritual baptism, then what is the relationship between physical circumcision and, sp and physical baptism? Well, they, they are related also. And that means, if they are related, then all of a sudden we've got some interesting um, uh, ramifications, like, say, for infant baptism. Um, in the Old Testament, infants were circumcised, and there's been a great deal of debate whether infants should be baptized in the New Testament. Well, if circumcision and baptism are tightly related, as Colossians 2.11 uh, uh, indicates, then yes, I think we can say one is a sign of the other. So are spiritual baptism and physical baptism related? Again, yes. Are spiritual circumcision and physical baptism related? Obviously. What is to prevent us, Peter might ask, uh, in the presence of Cornelius, from drawing the last side of this square and saying there's a connection between physical circumcision and physical baptism? God in the time of the sickness, God in the doctor too. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.